you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1 today. And uh, we're going to begin in verse 18 and read through verse 25 in just a moment. But many of you may know that I grew up in East Tennessee, the far east corner of Tennessee in the hills of, uh, of the Appalachian Mountains. We call them hollers, but uh, hills will work for today. Uh, my wife grew up in Asheville, North Carolina, just across the state border. And so we both are kind of from that area where there are, are actually some pretty beautiful mountains. And what we've found is, having moved to Louisville almost 15 years, well, over 15 years ago, that when we travel back, we very often realize that we used to take those mountains for granted. They had become so familiar to us and so much a part of who we were and what we did and where we lived that we took them for granted because they were familiar. And so we were missing the grandeur and the beauty of stuff that was so familiar to us. We missed the richness of those colors in the fall simply because they were so familiar to us. And as we come to the first chapter of Matthew this morning, we have a rather familiar passage again, and I hope that it's not one that we can just skip over and miss the weight and the gravity of what it is that Matthew is saying here. And I also hope that, that we can receive great joy from this passage this morning. Now listen, we, we all know that 2020 has not been the most amazing year, uh, probably making this the not-so-perfect Advent season. But I pray that this morning we can approach this familiar passage of Scripture and be encouraged to find hope in the fact that God is indeed with us in the person of Jesus Christ. So as we begin this morning, I want to read this passage in full. And then we'll look at a few uh, specific elements of it. Let's read this together in Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. The first thing that I want you to see this morning and to focus on as we look at the fulfilled hope of a Savior is that the birth of Jesus is the birth of the Messiah. The birth of Jesus is the birth of the Messiah. Now, it's easy for us to come to a passage like this that we're so familiar with and a thought like that that we're so familiar with and kind of say, well, yes, of course. But we might accidentally overlook the reason that Matthew included this story. Now, certainly we need to know facts about the birth of our Savior. We need to know facts about the fact that this was a miraculous virgin birth that fulfilled the Old Testament passage. But the question also can come of why did Matthew put this story right here in this way at this time? And I think we can see a few different things as we look at the details here that gives us the answer to that. What we find in this context is that Matthew is trying to show us that Jesus is unmistakably the Messiah, the son of David, the royal king that Israel has been longing for. That's what he's trying to show us in this context. If you notice, Matthew presents this narrative first from the perspective of Joseph. So Joseph is kind of the main character here, humanly speaking. And the main focus of this story is the naming of Jesus. Notice first some of these elements of naming. Number one, the angel brings Joseph this clarifying message of who this child is, but that message ends with what his name will be. 
Matthew also tells us at the very beginning of the narrative that this is about the birth of Jesus Christ. So there the name Jesus pops up again. The fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14, that's quoted in verse 23, is about the naming of a child to be born to a virgin. That name is not Jesus in that case, but it's Emmanuel, still a focus on the naming. This child who is named Jesus is also Emmanuel, God with us. And then this whole narrative ends in verse 25 with Joseph calling the name of the Son of God, Jesus. Now, we may initially not think too much about this until we begin to see how Matthew has situated this narrative following the genealogy in chapter 1. In verse 16, if you go back there with me, notice that that genealogy ends with Joseph. But notice also that Joseph is not tied directly to Jesus in this genealogy because he is not Jesus' biological father. So verse 16 says this, Joseph, the husband of Mary, and then it's Mary of whom Jesus was born. So Joseph is the one that's in the lineage of David, but Jesus was born to Mary from the Holy Spirit, as verses 18 and 20 indicate. And so Matthew's next move then in his gospel, in order to show that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah, is to record Joseph's acceptance of and naming of Jesus as his own child. When Joseph named Jesus, it was the cultural way of Joseph, Joseph saying, he is my child. And so the focus here on Joseph is not just a neat and, and creative way for Matthew to include all of these main characters of the Christmas story that we're so familiar with. Rather, the focus on Joseph is exactly what places Jesus in the lineage of David so that we would know clearly that this child born in Bethlehem is the anointed king who would sit on David's throne forever. He's the one who would fulfill all of the covenant promises of a king that were given to David. All of the promises given to Abraham of a king who would bring peace and comfort and hope and joy to God's people. So Jesus, the son of Joseph, the son of David, is presented here in Matthew as the clear and the exclusive Messiah that God's people have been waiting for and longing for for millennia. Secondly, I want you to see Jesus Christ in verse 18. This is how Matthew begins the entire narrative, Jesus Christ He specifically adds the word Christ here to that introduction. Now, Christ is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Messiah. So, for those who would have been reading Matthew's gospel and hearing that, what they hear is this is the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, and it took place in this way. So, Matthew doesn't waste any time. He makes it clear immediately that this child born is the Messiah, the exact person that God's people have been waiting on to rescue them. Notice thirdly, Mary was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit in verses 18 and 20. Now, it's difficult for us to know how much Joseph would have understood this concept of the Holy Spirit. We have a a full-orbed theology of the third person of the Trinity as we think about the Holy Spirit, but what I think Joseph would have heard at the very least is that the Spirit of God is upon this child that the Spirit of God is with this child. And I have to imagine that when Joseph heard that this child was from the Holy Spirit, that he remembered passages like Isaiah 11. It says this, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Remember, Jesse was David's father. From that stump, there's going to come a shoot. A branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And listen to this, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. I have to imagine that Joseph put that together and he understood this child is from the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord is upon this child, and he is indeed the shoot from the stump of Jesse. Also a passage like Isaiah 61, you know this one from where Jesus quotes it in Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. That's the word Messiah, the anointed one. But look at what he's anointed him for, to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. I have to imagine that there's a lot of brokenheartedness in this room today and this year. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon the Messiah and He has been anointed specifically to bind up your soul and heart with hope today. That this child is from the Holy Spirit, as Matthew tells us, indicates that this child is God. And at least in these two Old Testament passages in Isaiah, Joseph knew and we know that this child is the one who would bear fruit as a descendant of David and would bring good news to the people who needed it most. Notice fourthly that this child will save his people from their sins in verse 21. This is the reason that's given for why his name will be called Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So not only is Jesus the Messiah historically as Joseph's son, but he's also the Messiah who would deliver God's people from the most pressing enemy that they have, namely their sin. So this birth narrative is a narrative about a child born who is the long-awaited Messiah, but it also makes clear that this Messiah will be the Savior of the world. His name, Jesus, means salvation. The Messiah that Israel needed and the Messiah that we need is not a political ruler who will remove the oppression of the government. If he does that, then great, but that is not ultimately the Messiah that we need. The Messiah that we need is not one who's going to make us rich so that we can reject God's provision. No, the Messiah that we need is one who will conquer death forever and will put death's dark shadows to flight as we are rescued by faith in his name. John 1.12 says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And everything that Matthew presents in this narrative of Jesus' conception indicates clearly that Jesus is this long-awaited Messiah. And I think it's tempting for us to visit these stories again and again every year and say, yeah, Joseph was a good dude. He was going to put her away quietly. He was going to divorce her quietly. He was a good guy. I get it. Yeah. The angel gave a great message. It got Joseph's attention. He kind of understood what was going on. Yeah, I know this, this birth fulfills the virgin birth passage. And I, we, we can come to these passages again and again and again and just kind of know facts. But when we step back a little bit and look at why Matthew includes this story at this time, in this way, in his narrative, we see the point that he is making is that this child is the long-awaited Messiah that God's people have been waiting for. And that has to be good news for us this year in a not-so-perfect Christmas. That surely is good news to us in a not-so-perfect Advent season this year. And so the second thing that I want you to see this morning is that the message of Jesus' birth is a message of hope. This message of Jesus' birth is a message of hope. We've mentioned already a couple of passages that indicate that what Matthew presents here is a message of hope, Isaiah 11 and 61, that surely Joseph brought to mind there. However, in this passage specifically, Matthew mentions Isaiah 7, 14, And says that these things took place in this way as a fulfillment of that passage. In other words, there was something revealed in the Old Testament that wasn't fully completed. And it was that thing to which God's people were looking for hope. And this event, the birth of the Messiah, was the fulfillment of that hope. And even more telling, I think, than just the fact that it was the full fulfillment of that hope is what this event fulfilled, namely God's presence with his people, Emmanuel, God with us. Now, I need to take a few minutes here and consider the historical backdrop a bit, especially from the perspective of Mary and Joseph and Simeon and Anna and Elizabeth and Zechariah and all of these characters that we know from these birth narratives. What was the situation like for them? What was their historical setting? What was the political setting? What was going on in the world that made this such a hopeful message? And in order to get the full brunt of their situation, I think it's important to go all the way back to the time of the Israelite kings. So I've made lunch reservations for you all around three. (laughs) Just kidding. Remember that this narrative is about the birth of the Messiah the anointed king of Israel. So we go all the way back to the beginning of kings. We have David in the early years of Solomon, pretty decent. But shortly after that, things went into decline very quickly. Beginning with Solomon's sons, there were very few godly kings in Israel and Judah, very few. 
And so this concept of a king who would come to deliver God's people was fleeing almost from the very beginning. The hope of a king barely got off the ground before uh, it began to be shattered. And along with this decline in kingship came the moral decline of God's people. And so we get the message of the prophets that is largely a message of calling Israel back to covenant faithfulness. And within that message of the prophets, you find that they are presenting consequences for the disobedience. And probably the worst consequence for Israel would have been the loss of the land of Israel. That land was a gift, and it was evidence that God was keeping His covenant with Abraham. And so without the land, it would seem as though God was not keeping His covenant. And indeed, their history reached that point. Northern Israel was defeated by the Assyrians, and southern kingdom of Judah was defeated by the Babylonians and taken into captivity. And at that point, 500 years before Matthew, almost 600 years before Matthew, at that point, the people of God were under foreign control essentially for the rest of their history, through the Persian era, through the Greek era, and then in Matthew under Roman rule. And one thing that's also interesting to mention here about the Babylonian exile and the captivity is Ezekiel's vision in Ezekiel 10 and 11 that the presence of God was going to leave the temple. So not only was Israel not in the land, but this vision of God's presence leaving the temple made it appear as if these covenant ideas of I will be with you are also annulled. In other words, I think the real life sense, the real on the ground feeling for God's people during much of this period and during much of the intertestamental period is that God was distant and quiet and silent. Now we, we know from the rest of Scripture that Israel did come back to the land during the Persian empires. This is where we meet characters like Ezra and Nehemiah, just kind of give you the whole history there. But even when the temple was rebuilt in Jerusalem, it was a far cry from the one that Solomon had built. And so the people look at it and maybe God's presence is back with us, maybe. And I have to imagine that it felt like these hopes of a Messiah were, were waning for God's people. Not only was life difficult on a national scale for them, but also individually. In this passage particularly, we find Joseph in the midst of what seems to be an adulterous scandal. Mary and Joseph were betrothed, we know this in verse 18, which amounted essentially to marriage without the consummation. And he finds out that she was with child. And so for Joseph, the only reasonable explanation for this is that she, would, she was unfaithful. And this surely was a heartbreaking experience for him. But being a just man, as verse 19 tells us, he decided to divorce her quietly so that he wouldn't bring shame on her. So think about this for a second. Joseph's plan in all of this, in light of a, what seemed to be a scandal, was to just bottle up the pain and the hurt and to just move on with life. That was his plan. As if the current historical and political situation wasn't depressing enough Joseph faced what seemed to be a personal scandal and left him broken and probably wondering where was God's presence in all of this. Now what I want us to see this morning is that in the midst of all of this tragic turmoil, Scripture presents to us the very people who were still holding on to these Old Testament promises of Messiah. Think of all these characters in the birth narratives who rejoice greatly at the announcement of Jesus' birth, and they rejoice greatly precisely because they were holding on to those promises that the Messiah would come, and they recognized Him when He came. Joseph, of course, had to be reminded by the angel, which is a pretty significant reminder. If you ever get one of those, just keep it in mind. But after the angel told him what was going on, I have to imagine that Joseph felt a sense of relief and hope to take Mary as his wife, not a sense of obligation. Look at what the angel tells Joseph in verses 20 and 21. First, he calls him the son of David. That's interesting. It's like he says to Joseph, hey, Joseph, remember, you're in the Davidic line. You are in the Davidic lineage. Now, this child is from the Holy Spirit, but I want you to give him his name. Because this child will be a son of David, the anointed king, our Messiah. Second, he says, do not fear. Probably a massive overstatement. <laughs> Calm down, man. It's going to be all right. 
I think it, we probably, if we tell each other that, we should do it in a little bit more uh, a kind way. But he basically says, calm down. It, it's going to be okay. Third, he says that the, the child conceived in your wife is from the Holy Spirit and you will call his name Savior. You will call his name Savior. This had to bring Joseph massive, massive hope as he encounters a difficult life. And listen, it's not just this message from the angel is not just a matter of Joseph getting a series of facts and then making a, a checkbox list of all the things that have to happen in order to raise the Son of God. Surely Joseph's heart leapt for joy and relief because of his greatest hope being fulfilled. It's easy to imagine that when Joseph heard these things that he recalled all of those Old Testament hopes of a Davidic king who would rule God's people with righteousness and justice, not like the kings of old, but the one who would bring righteousness and justice and blessings of the covenant relationship that God has with his people. Whatever may seem to be true historically and politically to Joseph, this message from the angel told him that God was coming to rescue in person not just in theory. Notice here also the connection to Isaiah 7.14. Notice that it's a comment from Matthew. It's not part of the angel's message. The quotation marks end in verse 21, at least in my Bible, and in 22 picks up Matthew commenting again. But even still, surely Joseph understood the angel's message to be connected to Isaiah 7.14. Look at all these words that are very similar. A virgin shall give birth. I think Joseph knew his wife was a virgin. She shall conceive and bear a son. Verses 20 and 21 says, that which is conceived in her and she shall bear a son. It's all the same language there. And I have to imagine Joseph is putting these pieces together. He's seeing what's happening. He's watching what God is doing among his people. Matthew clarifies for us that connection to Isaiah 7, 14. But for Joseph, The message of the angel alone was enough for him to joyfully take Mary as his wife in verse 24. Now, joyfully taking Mary as his wife wasn't going to make life any easier for them. Life was still going to be tough, but Joseph now knew that it would be bearable because this son was the fulfillment of the hope of a long-awaited Messiah. Not only had God's presence technically returned to the temple, but God now has become flesh and was dwelling among his people in a person. Now, as we consider how to apply a passage like this to our own lives, I want to encourage you to think about how similar our lives often feel to these characters in Jesus' birth narratives. We often face adversity in our lives where God feels very distant and God feels very quiet. That's not abnormal for us. We, we've experienced that. We face death of loved ones and we face loneliness in ways that seem unprecedented in our times. We may face financial hardships that lead us to wonder whether God really is our provider. And right now we face a global pandemic that has left more upheaval in its wake than just public health issues. But in the same way that Mary and Joseph were holding on to the covenant promises of God that a son of David would come as the Messiah, we also are waiting on Messiah to come again. We find ourselves in a very similar situation with the turmoil of life waiting on the hope of Messiah to come again. And I pray that we are holding on to those same promises that Joseph was, that we long for the day that Jesus will return and make all things right. This message of hope that was brought to Joseph is the same message of hope that we carry. And this is the message that will bring us through any despair that life will throw at us. Now, while this is the same message of hope, I hope we can also see that it's even more hopeful for us. Not only are we hoping for Messiah to come again, but we have the absolute confidence that right now God is with us because we know during this Advent season that Jesus Christ has already come. This is our fulfilled hope. Yes, we have a hope, but it's even more sure because it's already been fulfilled in the first coming. And so we remember this season that Jesus has come And therefore, we have immense 
hope that He is with us through the difficulties of 2020 and that He will return to bring righteousness and justice and peace on the earth. And so this message of hope should bring us great joy. This message of hope should bring us great joy. The old Christmas hymns have some of the richest lyrics to bring joy during this season. And I think for me, especially much like those mountains of Tennessee, we become so accustomed to these songs that we miss their message of joy in the midst of our difficult lives. And one that came to my mind particularly this week was uh, naturally with this passage, and Emmanuel is, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here. And I think that many of us this year, or maybe just in life generally, we feel captive. We feel very captive to whatever it may be, captive to sin tendencies, captive to the principalities of, principalities of the air. Whatever it may be, we, very many of us feel captive. We feel lonely and in exile. We feel like God is distant and God is silent. But that only lasts for a time. That only lasts for a time. Look at the next line. Until the Son of God appears. That has to be a message of hope and joy for us this season. Yes, we feel captive. Yes, we feel lonely. Yes, we feel like we are in exile and we are distant. But God will come again. And when He does, the next line says rejoice. Rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Another song I thought about this week, and I'll end with this one, is O Holy Night. The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Not just our Savior's birth, our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining. The word pining is fantastic, and I've instructed Craig that we can never take that out of our hymns, we have to, we, we can't update that one, we have to leave it as it is, because the word pining has to do with a deep yearning, uh, yearning deeply, suffering with longing, this deep and unfulfilled desire that spurs us on, but we're pining, look at the song, in sin and error. Jesus came to save us from our sins. The name given to Him is Savior because He came to save us from this plight of pining around in sin and error. And so the song says, until He appeared. And the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices. And the question that I have for us today, including myself, is does your soul feel the worth of this Advent season? Does your soul feel the value and the joy of the coming of our Messiah and the hope that He will come again? Does your soul feel that worth? Because that's when you're going to realize there's hope in the midst of the sin and error. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices. We do indeed live in a weary world, and many of us are, are weary. We're just tired. But Messiah has come. The message of Matthew is that Messiah has come. God is with us, and even more, Messiah will come again, and therefore, we have hope. And I pray that this hope will give us great joy in this not-so-perfect Advent season. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, we thank You that You inspired men, humans, to write Scriptures in a way that these messages are clear, that we see clearly that Jesus is the Messiah that Matthew makes it very, very clear that Jesus is the one that we have all been waiting for and all been longing for. And Lord, we thank You that He chose to condescend and to become a man and to live among us, to be born, to live a perfect life and to die on the cross in order to save us from our sins. 
We thank you for these truths. We bless you. And God, I pray that through your spirit and by your power, we would, we would have great joy this season. It's been a difficult year. It's been difficult weeks. But Father, we pray that your spirit would stir in us affections of joy and hope during this season, that we would look to you, the author and the perfecter of our faith, that we would be those people who endure trials with hope and with joy. So Father, we pray that your spirit would do a work in us that we cannot do, and we pray that we would return glory to you when that happens. In Jesus' name, amen.